Donald Trump stands up in front of his cult this weekend and tries to make Ashley Bobbitt into a martyr and plays the new second national anthem, the Ashley Bobbitt January 6th hostages song. Remember, he is even more full of shit than you knew before. Testimony from January 6th from a White House valet in the back dining room from which Trump watched the riot he caused, watched the attempt to sack the Capitol, watched the attempt to overthrow democracy in this nation, was made public for the first time yesterday, and it shows that Trump was handed a note card reading, quote, one X civilian gunshot wound to chest at door of House chamber. The valet saw the card, quote, I remember seeing that in front of him, yeah. The valet was asked by the investigator, do you remember the president's reaction when he received this note? No. I mean, I just remember seeing it in front of him. I don't remember how it got there or whatever, but there was no, like, reaction. No, like, reaction. This is not a shocking revelation. We know Trump cares about no human life but his own does not truly understand that there is any human life besides his own. But it is stark and grotesque, and even at the remove of three years and two months and 16 days, it is enraging. A woman, however dangerous, however misguided, however lost, a woman who was trying to destroy her own country has been shot through the chest, and he can't even be bothered to react to it. And now he is using her. We know this happened. We know of Trump's inhumanity. We know of this testimony because this heretofore unknown interview by the House January 6th committee was released yesterday by the Republicans who are now trying to discredit that committee, trying to somehow exonerate Trump, trying to rewrite history, gaslight the world, and make Trump and his terrorists by proxy the victims and not the traitors. And of course, those House Republicans have completely screwed it up. Trump looks worse and worse and worse. Per Politico, those moron Trump Congress whores thought one fact in this testimony would make Trump look heroic, and concerned, and of course, it just makes him look more of a coward and more of a weakling. They thought this testimony by the understandably unidentified valet would show that during his coup, Trump wanted to talk to General Mark Milley and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, and thus, that would make this their fault. The Republicans in the House either did not notice or did not understand that the valet's testimony shows that if Trump really did think it would have been responsible to call Milley or Pelosi or both of them, he begged off and didn't do it. Quote, what I remember about the National Guard was him wanting to talk to National or talk to General Milley and Speaker Pelosi about the National Guard. Those were two of the three conversations that I knew he wanted or telephone calls that he wanted to make was to Speaker Pelosi and General Milley about the National Guard. I remember hearing that just, and then the rest is redacted. Then comes the point Trump's apologists ignored. They asked the valet if he heard that Trump had spoken to either one of them since he was in the room with Trump. I do not know if any of those phone calls were connected or not. Of course, we know from General Milley and Speaker Pelosi and what's left of the phone records that Trump talked to no one who could have helped stop the insurrection that day. We know, because we know what Trump is, that he talked to no one who could have stopped it because he did not want it stopped. I'm going to stop mocking the House Republicans now who put out this transcript because they have added to our knowledge of just how derelict in his duties Trump was on January 6th. It does say there at 1120, the interviewer says to the valet, call with V POTUS. Are you aware of the call that the president had with the vice president on the morning of the 6th? The valet answers, yes, sir. Tell me about that. What do you remember? The valet was in the room with Trump. There's six and one quarter lines redacted. And then, quote, Mike, this is a political career killer if you do this. Do what's right. 
And at that time, I was already walking out of the Oval Office, and I did hear Vice President Pence, like, start talking. I could just tell in his, Trump's voice, when he was talking to the Vice President, that he was disappointed and frustrated. Me and him, I think, close to the end of the day, he just mentioned that Mike let him down, unquote. So on January 6th, Trump really did threaten Pence over his refusal to breach the Constitution and stop the peaceful transfer of power. And then, per the testimony of the valet, Trump sat there most of the time in the private dining room in the back and just watched the carnage unfold. Four TVs, the valet said. Fox News, CNN, and he thinks Fox Business and MSNBC. For three hours, quote, he only really moves in between the private dining room, the bathroom, the Oval Office, and the outer Oval Office, unquote. And then Ashley Bobbitt was shot and killed. And the next thing of substance Trump said hours later was, Mike let him down. He sat there. He watched. He worried. He worried about himself. Screw Bobbitt. Screw the cops. Screw the senators. Screw the congressman. Screw the vice president. Screw America. The Republicans think this will help Trump because he may have briefly thought of calling General Milley or Speaker Pelosi. Instead, it just underscores that whatever he thought, whatever went through that broken brain of his during one of the brief interludes in which he was not thinking about himself, ultimately he did not call General Milley and he did not call Speaker Pelosi. And the road to hell is paved with good intentions or Trump's intentions. And just to put the exclamation point at the end of the sentence, Trump is a traitorous subhuman terrorist, down there on page 66 of 70 of this transcript, brought up for reasons or related to details we cannot see because of redactions, there is the final revelation that at his core, Trump is an angry, thwarted, stupid toddler. Question. Do you remember the president ever tearing up or destroying documents that he had seen? The valet then answers, quote, that's typically what he would do once he's finished with a document. But that was his sign of like he was done reading it and he would just throw it on the floor. He would tear everything, tear newspapers, tear pictures. On January 6th, he would, you know, it didn't have to be that picture. But as an example, he likes to look at pictures and he would just tear it once he's done looking at it and just throw it on the floor. That led to the obvious follow-up question. Do you remember the president doing that on January the 6th? And finally, the valet gives an answer that might explain why somebody thought this document would help Trump. Or at least the valet starts to give an answer that might explain why somebody thought this would help Trump. Quote, I don't remember, sir, but you know, it wouldn't surprise me that there was a pile. And then... Lastly, and most disturbingly, the plaintive plea from somebody else who has made the terrible, life-destroying decision to trust Trump. The questioner asks if the valet wants to put anything else on the record before they close. Quote, again, it's just me personally. I'm just like paranoid. And this is like, and my anxiety, I just, I really don't. Again, I don't like I'm real worried about my name or my title or anything to associate me with this because, again, typically I just really don't want to be involved in this because I don't think, you know, it was my job to be involved. But that's what I just really want to be able to protect my name and myself from anybody trying to reach out to me. So the Republicans released the transcript and somebody there can figure out who this is and jeopardize this man's life. And somewhere he has heard about them putting this transcript out and he did not sleep last night because the Republicans thought the fact that he didn't see everything that others saw and testified to, that that exonerates Trump or dirties up the committee and changes the dialogue about January 6th. 
because he said Trump wanted to call Milley and Pelosi, even though, oops, he didn't, because the Republicans and Trump would be happy to see his mob hang this poor man if it meant Trump looked 1% less guilty of treason than he does right now. And so, once again, to hell with all of them, Trump first. Hey, want to buy a golf course slightly used in the first sign that the New York Attorney General Letitia James does not expect Trump to come up with the bond for the $464 million and she does not expect him to pay the money himself and she does not expect him to declare bankruptcy and thus stall and complicate further. It was revealed yesterday that her office has filed judgments two weeks ago in Westchester County. The first step a creditor takes to recover property in lieu of a debt owed the step you take before the lien and the foreclosure what trump owns in suburban westchester is seven springs an estate in mount kisco a surprisingly ungaudy looking mansion and what else a golf course net value around 30 million dollars in fact, Seven Springs came up during the hearings before Judge Arthur Engeron. It is one of the reasons Judge Engeron penalized Trump so heavily. A professional appraiser assessed it in 2014 at being worth $30 million. In Trump's financial statement, he said it was worth $261 million. So if the plan is to seize that, it will not be the last property they seize. Meanwhile, in the Stormy Daniels case, good news, everyone. Alvin Bragg has told the court that in that case, that Trump's document dump stall there is barely relevant. In his filing, he says that of the more than 100,000 pages of evidence and testimony just turned over by federal prosecutors, the pages Trump demanded, fewer than 270 pages are, quote, relevant to the subject matter of the case. And thus the trial, which should have started Monday, should in fact start on time as rescheduled on Monday, April 15th. And from the ridiculous to the absurd. If the Republicans hurt Trump by releasing that valet's transcript, there is always the Democrat who can hurt President Biden. They have pulled his coffin out of the crypt and stood Merrick Garland upright. And they have asked him about his tin-eared, irresponsible, amateurish, injurious decision to not take out Robert K. Hur's amateur neurology guesswork report from her's self-destructive, pro-Trump special counsel report on President Biden and those documents, and Garland is enraged. Quote, it's consistent with the precedents, the full disclosure of all special counsel reports in the entire 25 years in which the regulation has been in effect. The idea that an attorney general would edit or redact or censor the special counsel's explanation for why the special counsel reached the decision the special counsel did, that's absurd. No one from the White House has said that to me, unquote. One assumes if that last part is the case, if Garland is not lying, that no one from the White House has said that to him, it's because the White House has already figured out what has become increasingly clear to the rest of us since the day he was sworn in as Attorney General, that it's just a question now of when firing him will hurt President Biden the least politically, and that Merrick Garland is not worth the price of the oil with which to fry him in hell. (laughs) 
sports. Day three of the show, hey, me, the money gambling scandal. And it's hard to believe the Los Angeles Dodgers could have done something that could have made it all exponentially worse. But they sure have. Per Chelsea Janes of the Washington Post after the Dodgers' second and final opening series game from Seoul, South Korea, quote, Dodgers public relations guarded Otani's locker as he changed, then told reporters he would not be speaking. When reporters surrounded his locker asking if he had a second anyway, he walked by and out of the clubhouse saying what the Japanese reporters translated as, have a good night. So now... On top of everything else, there's also a stone wall and maybe a cover up and certainly a dare to every single investigative journalist in two countries, sports and non-sports journalists here and in Japan, who not only recognize that the real prospect of one of the greatest sports scandals of all time is suddenly a perceptible thing with definable features, but each of whom is also living in a world in which their jobs and their employers are in mortal peril, and I guarantee you each one One of them is thinking, if I can only break this story, I can save my paper and the entire industry. Just review this for a second. On Tuesday, representatives of the biggest star in baseball, Shohei Otani, fresh off having signed a $700 million free agent contract with the Los Angeles Dodgers, representatives of Otani told ESPN that Otani had transferred $4.5 million to a bookie on behalf of his translator and maybe his best friend in American baseball, Ipe Mizuhara. Otani's people then set up a 90-minute interview with ESPN for the translator Mizuhara, who explained Otani was paying off his gambling debts for him so that he would stop gambling and paid the bookie directly so that Mizuhara would not have access to the money and use it to place more bets. In one of the few states where sports gambling is still illegal and while baseball still has a death penalty for any player associating with illegal gamblers. Mizuhara then addressed the Dodgers team with Otani in the locker room present and told the he's my friend he paid off my debts story after Tuesday's game in South Korea. The same Otani reps who sent Mizuhara to talk to ESPN then said none of that was true and that Mizuhara was lying. The Los Angeles Times then reported Otani's name had surfaced in an investigation of the bookmaker's illegal activities in Orange County, California. Otani's lawyers then said Otani had been the victim of a massive theft of millions of dollars and the Dodgers promptly fired the translator Mizuhara. Sources around Otani then leaked that the first Otani had heard of any of this was after the Dodgers game in Seoul on Tuesday. And then yesterday, sources throughout baseball indicated that neither the commissioner's office nor anybody else in the industry was conducting an investigation into Otani, into Mizuhara, or into any of the various different stories that have so far been produced. And most recently, the Dodgers kept the media away from Otani, and then they all headed home from South Korea. And of course, there wouldn't be any reporters trying to follow up on any of this in the media market the Dodgers call home, which is, checks notes, Southern California, which only consists of 24 million residents. For my part, I was flashed back to Southern California, back 35 years and to the parking lot of the Palm Springs Public Library in Palm Springs, California, which is next to what was Gene Autry Stadium, which is where the California Angels baseball team used to hold the second half of its spring training. And I'm there because I'm covering it for Channel 2 in Los Angeles. And the library is A, where our camera is for my live shot, and B, where the shade is, and C, where my copy of the new edition of Sports Illustrated is, the April 3rd, 1989 edition, with the title Pete Rose Under Siege, and a picture of him forlornly tossing a ball in the air because a winter of whispers about Pete Rose gambling on baseball that everybody had denied had suddenly exploded, and the entire sports world had been turned into the hunt to catch Pete Rose. Before you wonder why I would invoke Rose at this stage, the L.A. Times story yesterday about Otani began, and I'm quoting, 
Shohei Otani is no Pete Rose, at least not yet, unquote. And here we are again, reliving my flashback in the parking lot, except it's going to be the hunt to catch Shohei Otani. And if the Dodgers don't realize that, they're run by a bunch of morons. Because even if Otani is completely innocent here, somehow, and if he wired $4.5 million to a bookie to pay for $4.5 million really good cookies, he may have still broken the law. Even if Otani is completely innocent here somehow, Otani and his reps and the team and Major League Baseball have already screwed this up so badly that they may have eclipsed whatever the interpreter did or did not do. Yesterday, I said they had to answer as quickly as possible the old Watergate cliche updated, what did Shohei Otani know and when did he know it? Just since then. The actions of Otani and his representatives and the Dodgers and Major League Baseball have quintupled the number of questions that must be satisfied as quickly and thoroughly and honestly as possible. Why have you issued two or is it three different official versions of Otani's story? How could Otani have acknowledged he sent the bookie four and a half million dollars, then insist the money had been stolen from him and then insist he knew nothing about any of this? How long did the team know about this? Is the interpreter just trying to take a fall for Otani? Why did a Dodgers source remind ESPN that whatever happened, it happened when Otani was playing for the Angels? And maybe most saliently, the fired translator Mizuhara told ESPN in that interview that his annual salary was between $300,000 and $500,000. What kind of self-respecting bookie would let a guy with that level of income run up four and a half million dollars in unpaid gambling losses? Every hour that passes without this being addressed and resolved increases the chances that the true story here will be disastrous for Shohei Otani, for the Los Angeles Dodgers, for Major League Baseball. Disastrous, as in suspensions and lifetime banishments and tips of icebergs. Because that flashback I had to my live shot from the library about the start of the Pete Rose scandal at the end of March 1989, that flashback actually ends in New York on August 24th, 1989, where I'm at the press conference where the commissioner of baseball, the actor Paul Giamatti's late father, Bart, is announcing that Pete Rose has been banned for life. Postscript, the most expensive regular baseball card of Shohei Otani, not autographed by him, not one of a kind, not glow in the dark. It's now a 2020 Topps opening day series photo variation with Otani standing at the batting cage and looming over his shoulder, you see the figure of his pal and interpreter Ipe Mizuhara. The eBay price for this card, $1,179. There's also an Ipe Mizuharo autographed baseball available on eBay, $1,999.99. Baseballs signed by Pete Rose inscribed, I'm sorry I bet on baseball. Your cost, 99 bucks. <sighs> Also of interest here, a top Trump advisor or former Trump advisor, it's hard to tell anymore, says Chief Justice John Roberts was despicable for not sparing Peter Navarro from prison, and they plan to now appeal that decision to Jesus. Jesus H. Christ. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. Ahead of us on this edition of Countdown Fridays with Thurber, and since we are on the verge of another baseball season or another baseball scandal of biblical proportions, or both, let's go back to that wonderful mix of Thurber 
and Red Barber, the great Reds and Brooklyn Dodgers and New York Yankees play-by-play man, the Catbird Seat, next in Fridays with Thurber. First, still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. First, the bronze. Should do that as Red Barber, shouldn't I? Today's worst persons in the world, y'all. First, the bronze. Worse, the Tampa Bay Rays baseball team. They're owned by a friend of mine, in fact, but they have gone and done it. They have traded shortstop Greg Jones to the Colorado Rockies in exchange for a minor league pitcher. That minor league pitcher's name is Joe Rock. He is now Joe Rock of the Tampa Bay Rays. Until this awful news today, he had the chance to become Joe Rock of the Colorado Rockies. Thus, he will not join the annals of such perfect player placements as Johnny Padres of the San Diego Padres, Butch Metzger of the New York Mets, and Ted Cox of the Red Sox. Instead, Joe Rock will have to be filed with Cub Stricker, who never played for the Chicago Cubs, Jim Brewer, who never pitched for the Milwaukee Brewers, Randy Cardinal, who never appeared for the St. Louis Cardinals, Galen Pitts, who never played for Pittsburgh, Tyler Houston, who never played for Houston, hello, Yank Terry of the Red Sox, Johnny and Sam Dodge, who were never Dodgers, and of course, outfielder Angel Bravo, who never played for either the California Angels or the Atlanta Braves. It's a damn shame. The runner-up worser, Congressman Tim Burchett, the serial facial hair alterer, beard sometimes, mustache, soul patch, then clean shaven, then a different kind of mustache, Constant facial hair realignment is considered by some psychologists as a sign of emotional unsteadiness, if not actual distress. You know what else is this, that's a sign of? Retweeting Russian propaganda. The Midas Network reports that yesterday, Congressman Burchett retweeted what at first looked like a news story claiming President Zelensky of Ukraine was offended by the Trump proposal to make any military help to that country only in the form of loans that must be repaid. Burchett's account added, quote, bite in the hand that feeds you. This is what zero accountability looks like. You know what being a dupe for Russian propaganda looks like? Well, yeah, Jim, Jim, Jim Jordan and James Comer, yep, and Ron Johnson. But, but in this case, when the article attached to your snide subtweet was in fact published and tweeted by RT, Russian state television, Somebody in Burchett's office figured this out, deleted the retweet within an hour, and then presumably he went home and shaved his head. But our winner, the worst, Liz Harrington. I no longer know how to describe Liz Harrington because she used to be Trump's principal on-the-record spokesperson. Then they gave that role to some ex-UFC fighter with eight different necks. And then they hired another woman named Levitt, who may have gone to the same dental office Christy Nome did that infomercial for and does everything but wave her hand like the queen while she's reading the press release. It appears Liz Harrington may have been fired two months ago, and if that's the case, presumably it had something to do with her increasingly bizarre comments, which more and more seem to conflate Trump with God. Suddenly, Liz Harrington is back after a couple of months appearing with Steve Sloppy Bannon on the Real America's Voice channel, which is a streaming propaganda service for those who find Newsmax too balanced. Liz Harrington apparently now works for them, though they ID'd her as former Trump senior advisor. And guess what? Her trolley is completely off the tracks. She's gone full, Jesus can overrule the Supreme Court while complaining about Peter Navarro going to prison. Thank God we do not have to appeal to Chief Justice John Roberts, a despicable thing he did, and one man making a decision to keep, to send Peter to prison. Well, thank God we don't have to rely on his mercy because he has none. We rely, our appeal is to heaven. This is what we need to start doing. We have a power that is so much greater than these evil people. God laughs at them. He laughs at them. So we need to start using it. We need to start using Jesus Christ. We need to use the word and we need to pray. 
Now, look, why should we be worried about them doing this appeal to heaven jazz? I mean, the appeal to heaven flag was used by John Adams and the revolutionaries and the revolutionary war figures. And and no, MAGA thinks appeal to heaven means you ask God to help. And then he tells you to go and kill some liberal somewhere. And then when they arrest you, all you have to do is say, God told me to do this. And they say, well, that's all right, then you are free to go. That's the way they're now framing appeal to heaven. So if you want to know what this is really about, just look in the eyes of Liz. I'm not crazy. I'm not hallucinating. I'm just looking right into Jesus's eyes, aren't I, Jesus? Harrington, today's worst person in the world. It's an ischemic episode, lady. Number one story on the countdown, and since it is the weekend edition, it's time for some James Thurber. The catbird seat combines two of my all-time favorite things, Thurber and baseball broadcasting. As Thurber will reveal in the story, the title comes from a catchphrase used by the Brooklyn Dodgers legendary announcer Red Barber, the man who trained Vin Scully and is my late friend Vin's only true competition for greatest baseball play-by-play man of all time. I met Red Barber once. I interviewed him for CNN. He called me Keith throughout the interview. I was so starstruck, it's pretty much all I remember from the interview. Anyway, Burt Lancaster bought the movie rights to this story, and he got Billy Wilder to commit to direct it. Well, how come you've never heard of this perfect-sounding film, The Catbird Seat, directed by Billy Wilder? They sold the rights, and in 1960, the film was made, but they relocated it from Manhattan to Scotland, starring Peter Sellers dressed up as an old man as Mr. Martin. It's okay, unless you've read the story or had it read to you. From the Thurber Carnival, 1945, The Catbird Seat by James Thurber. Mr. Martin bought the pack of camels on Monday night in the most crowded cigar store on Broadway. It was theater time, and seven or eight men were buying cigarettes. The clerk didn't even glance at Mr. Martin, who put the pack in his overcoat pocket and went out. If any of the staff at F&S had seen him buy the cigarettes, they would have been astonished. For it was generally known that Mr. Martin did not smoke and never had. No one saw him. It was just a week to the day since Mr. Martin had decided to rub out Mrs. Old Jean Barrows. The term rub out pleased him because it suggested nothing more than the correction of an error. In this case, an error of Mr. Fitwiler. Mr. Martin had spent each night of the past week working out his plan and examining it. As he walked home now, he went over it again. For the hundredth time, he resented the element of imprecision, the margin of guesswork that entered into the business. The project, as he had worked it out, was casual and bold. The risks were considerable. Something might go wrong anywhere along the line. And therein lay the cunning of his scheme. No one would ever see in the cautious, painstaking hand of Irwin Martin, head of the filing department at F&S, of whom Mr. Fitwiler had once said, Man is fallible, but Martin isn't. No one would see his hand, that is, unless he were caught in the act. Sitting in his apartment, drinking a glass of milk, Mr. Martin reviewed his case against Mrs. Old Jean Barrows, as he had every night for seven nights. He began at the beginning. Her quacking voice and braying laugh had first profaned the halls of f and on March 7th, 1941. Mr. Martin had a head for dates. Old Roberts, the personnel chief, had introduced her as the newly appointed special advisor to the president of the firm, Mr. Fitwiler. The woman had appalled Mr. Martin instantly, but he had not shown it. 
He had given her his dry hand, a look of studious concentration, and a faint smile. Well, she said, looking at the papers on his desk, are you lifting the ox cart out of the ditch? As Mr. Martin recalled that moment over his milk, he squirmed slightly. He must keep his mind on her crimes as a special advisor, not on her peccadilloes as a personality. This he found difficult to do in spite of entering an objection and sustaining it. The faults of the woman as a woman kept chattering on in his mind like an unruly witness. She had, for almost two years now, baited him in the halls, in the elevator, even in his own office, into which she romped now and then like a circus horse. She was constantly shouting these silly questions at him. Are you lifting the ox cart out of the ditch? Are you tearing up the pea patch? Are you hollering down the rain barrel? Are you scraping around the bottom of the pickle barrel? Are you sitting in the catbird seat? It was Joey Hart, one of Mr. Martin's two assistants, who had explained what the gibberish meant. She must be a Dodger fan, he had said. Red Baba announces the Dodger games over the radio, and he uses these expressions. Pick them up down south. Joey had gone on to explain one or two. Tearing up the pea patch meant going on a rampage. Sitting in the catbird seat meant sitting pretty like a batter with three balls and no strikes on him. Mr. Martin dismissed all this with an effort. It had been annoying. It had driven him near to distraction, but he was too solid a man to be moved to murder by anything so childish. It was unfortunate, he reflected, as he passed on to the important charges against Mrs. Barrows, that he had stood up under it so well. He had maintained always an outward appearance of polite tolerance. Why, I even believe you like the woman. Miss Paired, his other assistant, had once said to him. He had simply smiled. A gavel wrapped in Mr. Martin's mind, and the case proper was resumed. Mrs. Algene Barrows stood charged with willful, blatant, and persistent attempts to destroy the efficiency and system of FNS. It was confident, material, and relevant to review her advent and rise to power. Mr. Martin had got the story from Miss Paired, who seemed always able to find things out. According to her, Mrs. Barrows had met Mr. Fitwiler at a party where she had rescued him from the embraces of a powerfully built drunken man who had mistaken the president of F&S for a famous retired Middle Western football coach. She had led him to a sofa and somehow worked upon him a monstrous magic. The aging gentleman had jumped to the conclusion there and then that this was a woman of singular attainments, equipped to bring out the best in him and in the firm. A week later, he had introduced her into F&S as his special advisor. On that day, confusion got its foot in the door! After Miss Tyson, Mr. Brundage, and Mr. Bartlett had been fired, and Mr. Munson had taken his hat and stalked out, mailing in his resignation letter, old Roberts had been emboldened to speak to Mr. Fitwiler. He mentioned that Mr. Munson's department had become a, a little disrupted, and hadn't they perhaps better resume the old system there? Mr. Fitwiler had said certainly not. He had the greatest faith in Mrs. Barrow's ideas. They require a little seasoning. A little seasoning is all, he had added. Mr. Roberts had given it up. Mr. Martin reviewed in detail all the changes wrought by Mrs. Barrows. She had begun chipping at the cornices of the firm's edifice, and now she was swinging at the foundation stones with a pickaxe. Mr. Martin came now in his summing up to the afternoon of Monday, November 2, 1942, just one week ago. On that day, at 3 p.m., Mrs. Barrows had bounced into his office. Boo, she had yelled. Are you scraping around the bottom of the pickle barrel? Mr. Martin had looked at her from under his green eye shade, saying nothing. She had begun to wander about the office, taking it in with her great, popping eyes. Do you really need all these filing cabinets? She had demanded suddenly. 
Mr. Martin's heart had jumped. Each of these files, he had said, keeping his voice even, plays an indispensable part in the system of F and S. She had brayed at him, well, don't tear up the pea patch, and gone to the door. From there, she had bawled, but you sure have got a lot of fine scrap in here. Mr. Martin could no longer doubt that the finger was on his beloved department. Her pickaxe was on the upswing, poised for the first blow. It had not come yet. He had received no blue memo from the enchanted Mr. Fitwiler, bearing nonsensical instructions deriving from this obscene woman. But there was no doubt in Mr. Martin's mind that one would be forthcoming. He must act quickly. Already a precious week had gone by. Mr. Martin stood up in his living room, still holding his milk glass. Gentlemen of the jury, he said to himself, I demand the death penalty for this horrible person. The next day, Mr. Martin followed his routine as usual. He polished his glasses more often and once sharpened an already sharp pencil, but not even Miss Paired noticed. Only once did he catch sight of his victim. She swept past him in the hall with a patronizing, Hi. At 5.30, he walked home as usual and had a glass of milk as usual. He had never drunk anything stronger in his life, unless you could count ginger ale. The late Sam Schlosser, the S of F and S, had praised Mr. Martin at a staff meeting several years before for his temperate habits. One of our most efficient workers neither drinks nor smokes, he had said. The results speak for themselves. Mr. Fitwiler had sat by, nodding approval. Mr. Martin was still thinking about that red-letter day as he walked over to the Schrafts restaurant on Fifth Avenue near 46th Street. He got there, as he always did, at 8 o'clock. He finished his dinner and the financial page of the New York Sun at quarter to nine, as he always did. It was his custom after dinner to take a walk. This time he walked down Fifth Avenue at a casual place. His gloved hands felt moist and warm, his forehead cold. He transferred the camels from his overcoat to a jacket pocket. He wondered as he did so if they did not represent an unnecessary note of strain. Mrs. Barrows smoked only Lucky's. It was his idea to puff a few puffs on a camel after the rubbing out, stub it out in the ashtray, holding her lipstick, saying Lucky's, and thus drag a small red herring across the trail. Perhaps it was not a good idea. It, it would take time. He might even choke too loudly. Mr. Martin had never seen the house on West 12th Street where Mrs. Barrows lived, but he had a clear enough picture of it. Fortunately, she had bragged to everybody about her ducky first-floor apartment in the perfectly darling three-story red brick. There would be no doorman or other attendants, just the tenants of the second and third floors. As he walked along, Mr. Martin realized that he would get there before 9.30. He had considered walking north on Fifth Avenue from Shrafts to a point from which it would take him until 10 o'clock to reach the house. At that hour, people were less likely to be coming in or going out. But the procedure would have made an awkward loop in the straight thread of his casualness, and he had abandoned it. It was impossible to figure when people would be entering or leaving the house anyway. There was a great risk at any hour. If he ran into anybody, he would simply have to place the rubbing out of old Jean Barrows in the inactive file forever. The same thing would hold true if there were someone in her apartment. In that case, he would just say that he had been passing by, recognized her charming house, and thought to drop in. It was 18 minutes after 9 when Mr. Martin turned into 12th Street. A man passed him, and a man and a woman talking. There was no one within 50 paces when he came to the house, halfway down the block. He was up the steps and in the small vestibule in no time, pressing the bell under the card that said Mrs. Old Jean Barrows. When the clicking in the lock started, he jumped forward against the door. He got inside fast, closing the door behind him. A bulb in a lantern hung from the hall ceiling on a chain seemed to give a monstrously bright light. There was nobody on the stair which went up ahead of him along the left wall. A door opened down the hall and the wall on the right... He went toward it swiftly on tiptoe. 
Well, for God's sakes, look who's here, bawled Mrs. Barrows, and her braying laugh rang out like the report of a shotgun. He rushed past her like a football tacker, bumping her. Hey, quit shoving, she said, closing the door behind them. They were in her living room, which seemed to Mr. Martin to be lighted by a hundred lamps. What's after you? she said. You're as jumpy as a goat. He found he was unable to speak. His heart was wheezing in his throat. I, yes, he finally brought out. She was jabbering and laughing as she started to help him off with his coat. No, no, he said. I'll put it here. He took it off and put it on a chair near the door. Your hat and gloves, too, she said. You're in a lady's house. He put his hat on top of the coat. Mrs. Barrows seemed larger than he had thought. He kept his gloves on. I was passing by, he said. I, I recognized. Is there anyone here? She laughed louder than ever. No, she said. We're all alone. You're white as a sheet, you funny man. Whatever has come over you, I'll mix you a toddy. She started toward a door across the room. Scotch and soda be all right, but say you don't drink, do you? She turned and gave him her amused look. Mr. Martin pulled himself together. Scotch and soda will be all right, he heard himself say. He could hear her laughing in the kitchen. Mr. Martin looked quickly around the living room for the weapon. He had counted on finding one there. There were and irons and a poker and something in a corner that looked like an Indian club. None of them would do. It couldn't be that way. He began to pace around. He came to a desk. On it lay a metal paper knife with an ornate handle. Would it be sharp enough? He reached for it and knocked over a small brass jar. Stamps spilled out of it and fell onto the floor with a clatter. Hey! Mrs. Barrows yelled from the kitchen. Are you tearing up the pea patch? Mr. Martin gave a strange laugh. Picking up the knife, he tried its point against his left wrist. It was blunt. It wouldn't do. When Mrs. Barrows reappeared, carrying two highballs, Mr. Martin, standing there with his gloves on, became acutely conscious of the fantasy he had wrought. Cigarettes in his pocket, a drink prepared for him. It was all too grossly improbable. It was more than that. It was impossible. Somewhere in the back of his mind, a vague idea stirred, sprouted. For heaven's sake, take off those gloves, said Mrs. Barrows. I always wear them in the house, said Mr. Martin. The idea began to bloom, strange and wonderful. She put the glasses on a coffee table in front of a sofa and sat on the sofa. Come over here, you odd little man, she said. Mr. Martin went over and sat beside her. It was difficult getting a cigarette out of the pack of camels, but he managed it. She held a match for him laughing. Well, she said, handing him his drink. This is perfectly marvelous. You, with a drink and a cigarette. Mr. Martin puffed not too awkwardly, and took a gulp of the highball. I drink and smoke all the time, he said. He clinked his glass against hers. Here's nuts to that old windbag Fitweiler, he said, and gulped again. The stuff tasted awful, but he made no grimace. Really, Mr. Martin, she said, her voice and posture changing. You are insulting our employer. Mrs. Barrows was now all special advisor to the president. I am preparing a bomb, said Mr. Martin, which will blow the old goat higher than hell. He had only had a little of the drink, which was not strong. It couldn't be that. Do you take dope or something? Mrs. Barrows asked coldly. Heroin, said Mr. Martin. I'll be coked to the gills when I bump that old buzzard off. Mr. Martin! she shouted, getting to her feet. That will be all of that. You must go at once. Mr. Martin took another swallow of the drink. He tapped his cigarette out in the ashtray and put the pack of camels on the coffee table. Then he got up. She stood glaring at him. He walked over and put on his hat and coat. Not a word about this, 
he said, and laid an index finger against his lips. All Mrs. Barrows could bring out was a... Really? Mr. Martin put his hand on the doorknob. I'm sitting in the catbird seat, he said. He stuck his tongue out at her and left. Nobody saw him go. Mr. Martin got to his apartment, walking, well before 11. No one saw him go in. He had two glasses of milk after brushing his teeth, and he felt elated. It wasn't tipsiness, because he hadn't been tipsy. Anyway, the walk had worn off all effects of the whiskey. He got in bed and read a magazine for a while. He was asleep before midnight. Mr. Martin got to the office at 8.30 the next morning, as usual. At a quarter to nine, old Gene Barrows, who had never before arrived at work before 10, swept into his office. I'm reporting to Mr. Fitwiler now, she shouted. If he turns you over to the police, it's no more than you deserve. Mr. Martin gave her a look of shocked surprise. I beg your pardon, he said. Mrs. Barrows snorted and bounced out of the room, leaving Miss Paired and Joey Hart staring after her. "'What's the matter with that old devil now?' asked Miss Paired. "'I have no idea,' said Mr. Martin, resuming his work. The other two looked at him and then at each other. Miss Paired got up and went out. She walked slowly past the closed door of Mr. Fitwiler's office. Mrs. Barrows was yelling inside, but she was not braying. Miss Paired could not hear what the woman was saying. She went back to her desk.' Forty-five minutes later, Mrs. Barrows left the president's office and went into her own, shutting the door. It wasn't until half an hour later that Mr. Fitwiler sent for Mr. Martin. The head of the filing department, neat, quiet, attentive, stood in front of the old man's desk. Mr. Fitwiler was pale and nervous. He took his glasses off and twiddled them. He made a small, bruffing sound in his throat. Martin, he said, you have been with us more than twenty years. Twenty-two, sir, said Mr. Martin. In that time, pursued the president, your work and uh, your manner have been exemplary. I trust so, sir, said Mr. Martin. I have understood, Martin, said Mr. Fitwiler, that you have never taken a drink or smoked. That is correct, sir, said Mr. Martin. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Fitwiler polished his glasses. "'You may describe what you did after leaving the office yesterday, Martin,' he said. "'Certainly, sir,' he said. "'I walked home. Then I went to Shraft's for dinner. Afterward, I walked home again. I went to bed early, sir, and read a magazine for a while. I was asleep before eleven. "'Ah, uh, yes,' said Mr. Fitwiler again. He was silent for a moment, searching for the proper words to say to the head of the filing department. Mrs. Barrows, he said finally, Mrs. Barrows has worked hard, Martin, very hard. It grieves me to report that she has suffered a severe breakdown. It has taken the form of a persecution complex accompanied by distressing hallucinations. I'm very sorry, sir, said Mr. Martin. Mrs. Barrows is under the delusion, continued Mr. Fitwiler, that you visited her last evening and behaved yourself in an, um, an unseemly manner. He raised his hand to silence Mr. Martin's little pained outcry. It is the nature of these psychological diseases, Mr. Fitwiler said, to fix upon the least likely and most innocent party as the um, source of persecution. These matters are not for the lay mind to grasp, Martin. I've just had my psychiatrist, Dr. Fitch, on the phone. Uh, he would not, of course, commit himself, but he made enough generalizations to substantiate my suspicions. I suggested to Mrs. Barrows, when she had completed her uh, story to me this morning, that she visit Dr. Fitch, uh, for I suspected a condition at once. Uh, she flew, I regret to say, into a rage and demanded, requested, that I call you on the carpet. You may not know, Martin, but Mrs. Barrows had planned a reorganization of your department. Subject to my approval, of course, subject to my approval. This brought you rather than anyone else to her mind, but again, uh, that is a phenomenon for Dr. Fitch, and not for us. So, Martin, I'm afraid 
Mrs. Barrow's usefulness here is at an end. I'm dreadfully sorry, sir, said Mr. Martin. It was at this point that the door to the office blew open with the suddenness of a gas main explosion, and Mrs. Barrows catapulted through it. Is the little rat denying it? She screamed. He can't get away with that! Mr. Martin got up and moved discreetly to a point beside Mr. Fitwiler's chair. You drank and smoked at my apartment, she bawled at Mr. Martin, and you know it. You called Mr. Fitwiler an old windbag and said you were going to blow him up when you got coked to your gills on your heroin. She stopped yelling to catch her breath, and a new glint came into her popping eyes. If you weren't such a drab, ordinary little man, she said, I'd think you'd planned it all, sticking your tongue out, saying you were sitting in the cat buried seat because you thought no one would believe me when I told it. My God, it's really too perfect. She brayed loudly and hysterically, and the fury was on her again. She glared at Mr. Fitwiler. Can't you see how he has tricked us, you old fool? Can't you see his little game? But Mr. Fitwiler had been surreptitiously pressing all the buttons under the top of his desk, and employees of F&S began pouring into the room. Stockton, said Mrs. Fitwiler, you and Fishbein will take Mrs. Barrows to her home. Mrs. Powell, you will go with them. Stockton, who had played a little football in high school, blocked Mrs. Barrows as she made for Mr. Martin. It took him and Fishbein together to force her out of the door into the hall, crowded with stenographers and office boys. She was still screaming imprecations at Mr. Martin, tangled and contradictory imprecations. The hubbub finally died out down the corridor. I regret that this has happened, said Mr. Fitwiler. I shall ask you to dismiss it from your mind, Martin. Yes, sir, said Mr. Martin, anticipating his chiefs. That will be all by moving to the door. I will dismiss it. He went out and shut the door, and his step was light and quick in the hall. When he entered his department, he had slowed down to his customary gait, and he walked quietly across the room to the W-20 file, wearing a look of studious concentration. From the Thurber Carnival, The Catbird Seat by James Thurber. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc., our satirical and pithy musical comments are from Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Dennis Leary, and everything else was pretty much my fault. Although I'd like to blame it on the interpreter. That's Countdown for this 229th day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,172nd day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment and the not regularly given elector objection option. Use the Insurrection Act. Use the justice system. Use the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is Tuesday. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. I had the scoop that you had the contract, then I had the story, the plane, and the hours. I wish you had signed with Toronto, dear show, hey, cause now my career has been sent to the showers. Where, where are you tonight? 
How could you leave me here all alone? I searched the world over and I thought I found a tawny, but you met the Dodgers and pff, you was gone. Thank you, Nancy Faust. <laughs>